Then Goliath, the Philistine champion from Gath, came out of the Philistine ranks to face the forces of Israel. He was over nine feet tall. Say, that's big. He wore a bronze helmet. Say, that's intimidating. And his bronze coat of mail weighed 125 pounds. Say, that's heavy. He also wore bronze leg armor. I got nothing to say about that. And he carried a bronze javelin on his shoulder. The shaft of his spear was as heavy and thick as a weaver's beam. If you want to know how big that is, just hang out with Zach Miller. He's a weaver. He can show you how big a weaver's beam is. And he does good at volleyball. It's tipped with an iron spearhead that weighed 15 pounds. Say, that's got to hurt. His armor bearer walked ahead of him carrying a shield. Say, that dude's going to die. <laughs> that dude's going to die. <clears throat> Goliath stood and shouted a taunt across to the Israelites. And I'm afraid that's what the giant's doing to you today. He is taunting you day after day after day. And you ain't experiencing triumph because all you hear are the taunts. Let me just declare it in Jesus' name today. Giants are about to fall in this place. In the name of Jesus, they are about to go down. He shouted a taunt across the, to the Israelites. Why are you all coming out to fight? I am the Philistine champion, but you are only the servants of Saul. Choose one man to come down here and fight me. If he kills me, then we will be your slaves. But if I kill him... You will be our slaves. I defy the armies of Israel today. Send me a man who will fight me. When Saul, Saul was the leader. Saul was the leader. Saul was the leader. All of you are called to be leaders. The speed of the leader is the speed of the team. So if the leader is fearful and shaken, the rest of the team is as well. The pastor is the real worship leader of the church. It's the law of the lid. It's why I've learned to sit on the front row and lead worship with my team. It's my response to God. The speed of the leader is the speed of the team. The speed of the leader is the speed of the team. Send me a man who will fight me. And when Saul and all the Israelites heard this, they were terrified and deeply shaken. Jump down to verse 16. For 40 days, every morning and evening, the Philistine champion strutted like Dave Davis did in front of Allie to win her. He strutted in front of the Israelite. You know it's true. Girl, you know it's true. The Philistine champion strutted in front of the Israelite army for 40 days every morning and evening. Hug somebody around you and say, it is good to be in church and have a seat. Thank you, Cody. Thank you, Cody. Thank you, Cody. Have a seat. Have a seat. Have a seat. Have a seat. It's good to be here, right? It's good to be back with you. It's good to be back at Eastland. I think Hee Haw just broke out in here. <laughs> and now for something completely different. <laughs> it's good to be back with you, church. I come from the land down under in Tennessee <laughs> where God has planted us and we're four months strong at overflow. And we've seen incredible victory in our church already. We started out in homes, and homes couldn't hold us. We went to a building, that building couldn't hold us. We hit over 200 people this last weekend, by the way. So now we have two services starting on February 21st. We've seen the dead raised to life in Christ. As a matter of fact, next week, we're going to baptize a ton of people in our church. And we're going to dedicate babies. And anything else that begins with B, we'll do as well. We'll boil and barbecue and baptize and baby dedicate and b b boo, you know. We'll, we'll talk about booze. I don't know. We'll do something like that. But God's been good. We've been experiencing victory. Because when you have faith, if you don't activate your faith, your faith is dead. What did James say? Faith without works is what? Come on, you got to talk back to me. You came to church today, you're going to participate with me. Faith without works is? It's dead. Last week you talked about living faith. This week we're going to talk about active faith. You know why? Because the Bible says that the word of God is living and active. 
It's active. It's not enough to just say I have faith and use Christian platitudes and post nice scriptures. If you never activate those, if you never apply those, you're never going to experience the victory in your life. We have to activate it. I tell preachers all the time, if a message is not going super well, just get excited about a couple of verses and everybody will get into it. If God is for us, who can be against us? Everybody will amen that. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. Everybody says amen, but I see a powerless church, mostly across our country. We're fearful. We have escapist mentality. There are very real threats. There are very depraved things happening in our culture. But when did we think that we didn't have victory over all of that? We say we have faith, but we're not active with it. If I was to ask you a question before we even started, when's the last time you experienced victory in your life? When's the last time it happened? When's the last time you evangelized and somebody came to the Lord? I know when's the last time for me. I'm not going to put them on the spot, but last night somebody came to Jesus and gave their life to him and was raised to. And it was awesome. We set up mile markers or Ebenezer's for all you King James people around there. All over our building and overflow. Every time God does something good, we take a picture of it and we make a plaque of it. And we put it everywhere to be reminded of everything that God has ever done. To remember that God still wins the battle. God is still victorious. And every time we face giants, those giants got to fall. Here's what we think about the Christian life, though. Even the church. We think we're on a cruise ship. But really, we're on a battleship. We are on a battleship, not a cruise ship. We're on a battleship, not a cruise ship. This life is a battle. Why would Paul say, put on the full armor of God if it's not a battle? But most of us want the security of eternity, but not the battle of life. And we want the church that fits our preferences that's comfortable for us, a Christian life that's super comfortable and convenient. And so we want it to be a cruise ship because we like Disney and we want it to be like Disney because Disney's full of dads who have dad bod and I'm comfortable to take my shirt off at the pool there. So that's the kind of cruise I want. We want it to be like a vacation. It's not a cruise ship. We are in a battle. We are in a battle every single day. It is war out there. Now, our battle is not with flesh and blood, but with principalities and powers of the air. We are on a battleship. And the cool thing about the Christian life is Jesus is already won, and we have no reason to fear. A mentor of mine likes to use the movie U571 as an example which is, I think, a terrible movie. Is back when Matthew McConaughey couldn't act. Now, all of a sudden, he's like the greatest actor on the planet. But he talked about the guys on the submarine. Every one of them knew how to do each other's job in case something crazy happened. In case somebody died. In case somebody got sick. That's what it's like. That's what we're on. We're here doing this together. We know how to do each other's job. We have a battle. But the problem is, the enemy has deactivated our faith. He does it corporately, and he does it individually. And I just wonder what kind of giants are you facing in your life today? A giant of fear? A giant of complacency? A giant of excuses? A giant of being more concerned about your preferences instead of his presence? Overflow has a vision. And we have people come in that come from different backgrounds and like different things. And we don't argue with them about that. We just say, this is what God called us to do. This is the vision we're going after. If that's not for you, that's cool. Please go serve at a church somewhere. There's no division. We work together. But at our church, we desire his presence more than our preferences. 
We want to do it with excellence, but we still want his presence more than anything else because everybody's got their preferences. You all do. Everybody tell me your favorite color on the count of three. One, two, three. Okay, see, everybody's got preferences. At Overflow, we have decided that our favorite color is blue, and that's the color we're going after. It's cool that you have preferences. It's cool that you like orange. It's cool that you prefer hymns. It's cool that you like Hillsong better. It's, it's cool that you prefer the NASB. Those things are fine. But we have to get under the banner of Jesus and desire his presence instead of our preferences. Because we're losing the battle when we're making excuses because of things we prefer. And the problem with our preferences most of the time is they are man-based, not spirit-based. And we argue and fight all over the, 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 the church world over our preferences and our methodology. And we use words like we, we're either big or deep. No, you can be big and deep. Hymns or, were, hymns or contemporary. It can be hymns and contemporary. It doesn't matter. All that matters is Jesus. That's all that matters. So some of us face that giant of our excuses. You haven't experienced victory in 40 days, 40 nights, 40 years, 4 years, whatever. Maybe your giant is that failure, that guilt that you feel. Maybe the giant for this church is this is just Metropolis, Illinois. Please never say that. I told our team at a leadership advance a couple weekends ago, if you're going to be a leader on this team, no limitation language. God called me to McKinsey. It didn't make sense. But God's doing some things, and I'll never limit him. I'll never go, well, because we're in a small town, we can't do this. I'm like, uh uh, God, I'm going to set out another jar. If you want to fill it up, fill it up. Then I'm going to set out another jar. If you want to fill it up, fill it up. You know, God has a, has a habit of doing things in small towns like, oh, little town of Bethlehem. When the Savior's on the scene, miracles are birthed in small towns. No limitation language whatsoever. What is your giant? Your unforgiveness, your complaining. And it's barking at you and taunting you day after day after day after day. You see, the enemy wants you to forget your identity. The enemy wants you to forget your identity. I don't know if you noticed what Goliath did. He said, I'm the Philistine champion. But you are only servants of Saul. Half truth. It was a half truth. It was a half truth. Who were the Israelites? Who were they? Whose people were they? They were God's chosen people. That was his army. Yes, the spirit of God left Saul in the chapter before. And so the speed of the leader is the speed of the team. But the enemy wants to forget who you are. If you've been saved by Jesus, just say, oh yeah. Okay, you are robed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. You are his child. You've been adopted into his kingdom. The same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. But the enemy wants you to forget that. You're nothing but servants of Saul. The enemy wants you to be isolated as well. Think about this. Philistine champion, nine foot tall. David got five smooth stones because, you know, scholars believe that there was four brothers of Goliath. By the way, that mother is the real winner here. (laughs) Give five nine foot babies. Can we just give her a hand? I mean, praise God. (laughs) There was no epidurals back then. It was all, it was all natural. I mean, just imagine it like, I, I thank God for my wife with the size of my son's head. I mean, that was some kind of, some kind of, listen, I want that head to grow. I've got a linebacker that I'm raising. I got retirement. I want to take one day. He is precious with his big head. He's super precious. That's the real hero of that story. But he wants you isolated. And so if there's Goliath and then there's his brothers and you think you have the best weapon, like the Philistines are are giving this perception that they have the best weapon. Why did they just not advance? Like we're going to play three on three. It's me and Kobe. 
against Zach and Darius, who can dunk, Brandon Holt. <laughs> if we got LeBron James, we're not afraid to go out on that court and go to battle. We're definitely not. So you think, if you think the enemy thinks it has the best weapon, why doesn't it attack? Because they know something about God's people that they have forgotten about themselves. Because they have seen God give them victory for no apparent reason. So the enemy's goal is to try to isolate you. Why? Goliath's big. He's nine feet. And so if a, if a normal-sized man got close to him, he would have the reach to defeat him. That's why the enemy tries to isolate you. It's the same way the lion hunts. The lion tries to isolate the wildebeest and the antelope and Pumbaa and Timon. The lion tries to isolate those things because he knows if he attacks the whole herd, he's going to get trampled to death. That's why he isolates them. And the enemy wants to isolate you. And there's some of you that are here, but you're not here. You're isolated right here. And every time you face a giant, you try to fight it alone and you get too close to the enemy and he cuts you. And you give up on church and community. It is not good for men to be alone. The enemy will always try to isolate you. Because he knows he has the vantage point if you get close to him. The enemy wants us to have a fear, fearful perception and make enough threatening noise to deactivate our faith. Can I tell you something about the enemy? If you're a believer in Jesus, he is all noise. He is all noise. The giant's big. Say it's big. Come on, church. Say it's big. Say it's intimidating. So, yeah, you got Jackson looking at Tyson. That don't seem like a fair fight. It's big and it's intimidating, but the enemy's not advancing either. He's trying to make a deal to isolate you. And then all he is doing is making noise. Making noise. I defy the armies of Israel. I defy your God. And whatever other curses that he said day after day after day. And see, sometimes we find the devil in a donut. I never understood what that phrase meant, Tim. People are saying, oh, we don't want to find the devil in a donut. Devils are not in donuts. Donuts are God's nectar of life. I don't know any other way to just describe that. Donuts will be at the marriage supper of the lamb when calories and carbs don't matter anymore. I'm telling you. Krispy Kreme? Heck yeah. Probably bacon too. Heck yeah. Because of Jesus, we can eat bacon. I'm thankful for that. All right. But some people think the devil do everything, does everything in their life. And yes, he does have power to create chaos into your life. But most of the time, we are good enough at creating our own circumstances. Amen? Oh, come on. You know your heart. You know the things that you say. You know the curses that come out of your mouth. You know the doubts that you have. How many of you know what I'm talking about? We are good enough at creating our own mess, right? Good enough at creating our own mess. Or sometimes, like Job, God allows some hardship to come because he wants to make us stronger. And this is what the enemy does, is he makes a lot of noise. First Peter says that he prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Like a roaring lion. He begins to growl and yell and scream and taunt to try to deactivate your faith, to get you fearful, to make you think there is no hope, to tell you that God is no good. And that's why Peter wrote before that verse, you need to be sober minded because the battle is in the mind. And the battle was in the Israelites' mind. He had them intimidated and fearful, and they thought, there's no way that I can defeat them. But let me tell you some truth. The devil is like a roaring lion. The creator of the universe is the Lion of Judah. 
For 40 days every morning and evening, the Philistine champion strutted in front of the Israelite army. For 40 days every morning and evening, the Philistine champion strutted in front of the Israelite army. And this is how I think some of you are battling your giants. Imagine, day one, put on the armor, rush out to the battle. Face the giant. The giant begins to taunt. Retreat. Retreat. Okay, nobody went. Nobody got out there that day. Nobody took on the giant. Day two, same old, same old. Get up, have a little breakfast, a little manna, manna and cheese, and then put on your armor, run out to the same old spot, the same old way, with the same old armor, with the same old giant, and he begins to do his thing, and the Israelite army retreats, retreats. Day 25, put the armor on. Maybe they're getting used to it by now. Same old armor, same old spot, same old giant, same old retreating. And maybe by day 38, somebody's like, dear God, will somebody go out there and do something? And then like, you know, Joe Hickabob or what, I can't, I don't know any Hebrew is like, today will be the day that I go out there. So the same old armor and he has the same old determination. Like sometimes when we get out of church and he has that swagger and he walks up and he sees the giant and he begins to retreat again. I think that's how you're battling your giant. I think you wake up the same old way in the same old day, get ready the same old way. And every day you think there's the giant and you're retreating. There's fear. There's failure. You put your armor on. Battle ready. I have my quiet time. I read my utmost for his highest this morning. I listened to some worship music. I put my armor on. Oh, there's the giant. And you retreat. And for some of you, it's not been 40 days and 40 nights. For some of you, it's been four years. You've been staring at that giant of anxiety. You've been staring at that giant of depression. You've been staring at that giant of complacency. You've been staring at that giant of fear. God's calling you to step out in the unknown, but that giant is screaming at you. And every day you come to church, every time you get in worship, it's God's calling you. So you put on that armor and you go, nope, nope, nope. And you retreat. You see the Israelite army wasn't victorious, but they weren't defeated as well. They were just retreating. But let me tell you something. A Christian, the Christian life is all about advancing. If you're not advancing, you are being defeated. Why didn't they advance? Why don't we advance? Why don't we have urgency with the gospel? Why don't we plug into our church? Why don't we sow into this ministry right here? Why don't we do what God's called us to do? You know why they didn't advance? Because there was a risk involved. It could have cost them something, Darius, because that giant was big. It could have cost them their very life. Listen to me. Write this down if you need to remember it. If the Christian life hasn't cost you something, you are not living the Christian life. It's not, you're not called to be on the cruise ship. It has cost you everything. Jesus said, deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. But where we get it in our head is that it's the most miserable life possible. Not recognizing the enemy's trying to steal, kill and destroy us. I took a $12,000 a year pay cut to step out on faith, stepping out into the unknown, not really knowing what it's going to look like. But because I followed Jesus, baby, I got life to the full. It's the best life possible. It cost me something, but the reward is so much greater than the risk. Come on. Come on. It's going to cost you something. So you're not willing to take that risk. You're not willing to step out. You're not willing to rush at the giant. All you hear is the giant. All you see is the giant. All you're focused on is the giant. Oh, you remember God did some things in your life before, but now you've hit a, hit a place where you're at a standstill. And you're saying, well, at least I'm not being defeated. Yes, you are. Because Paul said one time, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. 
So even if it costs you your own life, you still win. You still cross over to the other side, the thing that you've been hoping for and waiting for. If it hasn't cost you something, you're not living the Christian life. And it deactivates our faith. And we don't experience victory. Let me, let me, let me, let me just say something like this. Let me say it like this. Some of you haven't experienced spiritual victory in so long. Listen to me. I want to preach this for a second. Some of you haven't experienced spiritual victory so long in your life that you are rooting around in the world's produce aisle just to get that taste in your mouth again. You know how we can tell? Because you can tell by people who have been saved by the blood of the Lamb when they come in and they get around God's people because when carriers get around other carriers, it lights us up. We have the most powerful moment of the week, but you just can't worship. And then you start making excuses like, well, that's just not who I am. And I don't want to be phony. Why is, the, why is the church the only place we make that excuse? If God has saved you, you have a reason to worship him. I'm not telling you you have to get down and do the worm. But you better be obedient to respond to him. But some of you haven't tasted spiritual victory in so long. It's no wonder you're stagnant in your worship. You're stagnant in the word. You're stagnant in your prayer life. And you're rooting around looking for something that will make you exciting. Can we quit making excuses and saying, I don't want to fake it when I come in church. You better fake it till you make it. When I come into this place, God has saved me and he is worthy of all of my praise. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. You haven't tasted that victory in so long and you've been defeated by that giant. You haven't advanced on that giant of anxiety or depression or that or that marital problem that you have right now that you won't go to the Lord. You won't rush at your giant. You're rooting around in the world's produce aisle and you begin to self-medicate. And that's only temporary. It's only temporary. It's only temporary. And you say you've been a believer. You say you've been a believer for 15 years, but nothing lights you up. There's no brokenness in your life. There's no urgency with the gospel. There's nothing but deactivated, idle faith. Deactivated, idle faith. And then we come in to our comfortable American churches with our comfortable chairs just to try to get through the service and move on. As long as it don't cost me something, you're never going to live the victorious life until you activate your faith. Until you activate it. See, we need some Davids in this place. We need some Davids. We need some red-headed Davids in this place. (laughs) Because where Saul's army, who had been battle-ready... Every day, walking up, there's the giant. Retreat. Battle ready. Walking up, there's the giant. Along comes this little 14 to 16-year-old boy who had been working in the sheepfold, taking care of his father's sheep and goats. And his dad's like, hey, take your brothers some grain, some cheeses, cheeses of Nazareth. Take, take them some of those things. <laughs> That's a millennial joke. And he said, take them and check on your brothers and see how things are going. So when David shows up, they're getting ready and they're going out to the battle again. So David's like, I'm going to check this out. And of course, when he gets there, his brothers are like, dude, get away. Get out of here. You're embarrassing me. That's how my brother used to be when I was trying to get my Mac on with a girl. I was like, dude, brother, get away. You're bothering me, son. Get out of here, you little nerd. I know I, I was really awful to my brother, but they're like, get out of here. But David starts hearing the taunts. And when David hears the taunts, he's not looking at the giant. He's listening to what he's saying. And he's remembering who he is. See, we need some Davids in this place that's willing to rush at their giant, that's willing to quit looking at the giant as something intimidating and that can't be defeated. See, David's response to the giant was, who is this uncircumcised pagan Philistine that defies the armies of God? 
The rest of them are retreating every time that, that Goliath begins to taunt. And little bitty ruddy faced David is like, who is this filthy, uncircumcised, pagan, Philistine that defies the armies of God? And why is no one doing anything about it? Where are you at, David's? You need to look at that guilt that's screaming at you day after day and go, you're nothing but pagan. You are not of God. You will not define me and you're going to go down. You need to look at that failure and say, you don't represent my God. He cast my sins as far as the east is from the west. You're nothing but a filthy Philistine. You need to look at that complacency and that fear that you have and say, perfect love has cast out all my fear. You are not of God. You are not of God. And somebody needs to do something about it. And I will be that somebody. We are looking for Davids in this place. We are looking for churches to rise up and go, this drug problem in our community is not of God. Now, we're not going to go with hate. We're going to go serve them. We're going to give them the love of Jesus and watch that giant fall. We need people in this community to say, you know what? I'm sick and tired of the confusion with our students, and I'm willing to be David. I'm tired of hearing the taunts of the giant. I'm tired of hearing things can't change. I'm willing to go out and face that giant head on. Who is this uncircumcised, filthy Philistine. Active faith is aware of who you are. It's aware of who you are. David's job <clears throat> was the sheepfold. He was a shepherd and he knew who he was. David's like, I'll go do it. I'll go do it. Let me ask you something. Are you willing to say that? I'll go do it. Are, are, you, are you tired of fighting this, this battle mine? Are you tired of this giant defeating you? Hey, it's been four years. Yeah, you've kept coming to church, and that's a good thing. That means the enemy hasn't completely got you. But aren't you tired of retreating? Are you willing to say, I'll go do it? I'll go do it. That's why we have no limitation language at Overflow. Because we'll go do it. We will spend time on our knees crying out to the living God. We will make battle with the enemy. We had a woman that's been engaged with what we've been doing for a long time. And we have been praying for her husband. He got kicked out of a church because he went to a homecoming dance. They excommunicated him in front of everybody at the age of 16. He's 31 now. And so he was done with church. And his wife got plugged in, and she is all into what we're doing. So we rushed at that giant. We went to battle. We prayed with faith. Guess who was at church last Sunday morning? Guess who was at church last Sunday morning? He was so nervous about going to church, he was just doing it to get her off of his back. He's an EMT, and he had his gun on his side. He was so nervous, he's like, I forgot to put that up. I'm like, I'm cool with you having that in case somebody starts something stupid. But he was like sitting down and really nervous about it. But he said, when I got greeted, when I got seated, when worship started, when you started preaching, the Spirit of God came all over me. And I thought, oh my God, what have I been missing? It's time for me to go. Go after the Lord. That's the kind of victory that you can experience if you're willing to be a David. All I do is win. All I do is win, win, win in the name of Jesus when I recognize who I am. You're even greater than a winner. What does the Bible say? We are more than conquerors through Christ Jesus. You don't just win. You win above and beyond, baby. Somebody better shout for that in this place. David knew who he was. He said, I've been taking care of my father's sheep and goats. He said, when a lion or bear comes to steal a lamb from the flock, I go after it with a club and rescue the lamb from its mouth. David's bad. That's a bad dude. That's a bad dude. He fights bears. <laughs> if the animal turns on me, I catch it by the jaw and I club it to death. 
oh, you better get excited about this verse here because this is a man that recognizes who he is in the Lord. I have done this to both lions and bears, and I will do this to this pagan Philistine too, for he has defied the armies of the living God. He's like, God gave me the lion. God gave me the bear. This nine foot filthy giant is nothing. Your past victories prepare you for your present battles. That's why we, that's why we set up little mile markers for every baptism. For every moment, like with Josh, who, we was, who, who I was talking about. That's why we set those up to remember what God did. God saved that person. God saved that atheist. God restored that marriage. And the God that did that, we want you to do it again, God. Do it again, God. Do it again, God. Because this is who we are in Christ Jesus. More than conquerors. And see, Saul tried to give David his army, I mean armor. He tried to give him his armor. So David put on the armor. And he began to walk around. And he's like, I'm not used to this. I'm not used to this. I can't use it. So he took the armor off and he went and got the shepherd's staff. And he went and got the shepherd's sling. And he went and got a shepherd's bag because that's who he was. A shepherd. You know what that teaches us? You can't defeat the enemy in somebody else's identity. You cannot defeat the enemy in somebody else's identity. You cannot defeat the enemy in your pastor's identity. You got to be aware of who you are in Christ Jesus. And some of you are putting on the world's armor trying to defeat the enemy. Remember when I talked about self-medicating? Things are going bad in your marriage. So you self-medicate by putting yourself in front of the television and distancing yourself. You can't put on the world's armor and defeat the enemy. You got to be who you are. You got to be who you are. You got to take on the identity of the good shepherd. Oh, and they told, they told David, they said, you ain't ready. You're not battle ready. It doesn't matter if somebody tells you you're battle ready. When God says you're battle ready, you are battle ready and your giants will go down. You think I need it, don't you? I preached like three times this weekend, so... <laughs> you cannot defeat the enemy in somebody else's identity. Are you aware of who you are? Say, I'm a new creation. Say it, say it proudly. I'm a new creation. Say, I've been anointed. Say that I am robed in the righteousness of Jesus. Say, I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Say, I lost all my guilt and shame at the cross. Recognize who you are. Recognize who you are in Christ Jesus. Active faith is aware of who God is as well. Yeah, it's important to know who you are, but even more important to know who your God is. It's even more important to know who your God is. It's even more important to know who your God is. The Philistine said, am I a dog that you said send this ruddy-faced boy? I don't even know what ruddy-faced means, but whatever. You know, he said that you send this ruddy-faced boy. He said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to thwart you. I'm going to take you down. But David replied to the Philistine, you come to me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of heaven's armies, the God of armies of Israel, whom you have defied. Today the Lord will conquer you. The who? The Lord will conquer you. I will kill you and cut off your head, and then I will give the dead bodies of your men to the birds and wild animals. And the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel, and everyone assembled here will know that the Lord rescues his people, not with sword sword and spear. This is the Lord's battle and he will give you to us. You got to know who your God is. And some of you have forgotten about how good your God is. He is the God of angel armies. He is on your side. He is the God of victory. When you are in need, he is Jehovah Jireh, the Lord, our provider. If things are falling apart in your life, Colossians says that Jesus holds everything together. He is the God who is mighty to save. He saved people in this place. He is mighty to save. He is everlasting. He's the mighty warrior. He's the name above every name. Every king and every lord throughout history have to bow their knee to Jesus Christ and confess him as Lord. That's who your God is and that's who's on your side. Just look at somebody right now and say our God is good. Look at somebody and say our God is greater. You come at me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of the heaven's armies. 
You come at me with your weapon, but I come at you in the name of the Lord. I know who my God is. I know who my God is. Yeah, I did mess up. Yeah, guilt, the guilt giant, the guilt giant speaking into my mind every single day. But according to the cross of Jesus, I lose all my guilt and shame. His mercy and grace is available to me. I have a God of grace. Guilt, you no longer have me. Some of you are stuck in your past because you're looking at that thing you did. It's already been forgiven. you got to know who your God is and who that makes you in Christ Jesus. Active faith advances. Active faith advances. <clears throat> this is important. As Goliath moved closer to attack... David, 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 quickly, David, yeah, you, you little David, all right, as Goliath moved closer to attack, David, look at this, 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 this needs to be what you do today, David, quickly, quickly, ran out to meet him, no, putting on the armor, walking to the battle line, staring at the giant, and retreating. When David got the permission from Saul, David quickly ran out to meet him with one of these. Maybe not exactly these because these are probably for gardening, but maybe something like this. David quickly ran out to meeting because active faith advances. Active faith doesn't remain idle. We are called to advance the kingdom of God. We are called to advance with the gospel. You are called to advance personally and continue to grow. You are called to keep moving, keep advancing. I know enemy, the enemy may seem like he has the reach, but guess what? God's got the strategy to defeat him. Oh, are you catching that? Oh, I know it doesn't make sense on how this giant's going to go down. Because he's big and intimidating. And he may have the reach. But God has the strategy. Say, God has the strategy. David advanced on the giant. Then he took his shepherd's bag. Taking out the stone. That's going to symbolize our faith today. This stone right here. Because he was like bringing a knife to a gunfight. A stone versus a nine foot tall, big giant with a big sword. It's not going to make any sense, but it's going to symbolize our faith. You know the Bible says that if you have the faith of a mustard seed, you can tell that mountain to move. Wait just a second, guys. You can tell that mountain to move. You can take them back to your seat for a second. This is going to symbolize our faith. And David came out and he put the rock in the sling and he began to rush at the giant in the name of the Lord. He's advancing. I'm going to rush at the giant in the name of the Lord. He's advancing. Where's my David's at? Where's my David's that's willing to take their faith and put it in the sling and watch their giant fall? Aren't you sick and tired of it? Who wants your giant to fall in this place today? Say amen. Who's ready for that giant to fall? Who sees giants in our community and you're ready for them to fall? You better shout in this place because our God is a God of victory. Come on, where my David's at? And he put the stone in the sling and he slung it at the giant. He didn't get close to the enemy and it hit him smack in the forehead. And timber. Down goes Frazier. Down goes Goliath. Now the stone didn't kill him, but think about it. He had the bronze helmet on. Think about the accurate aim that David had to have. He got five stones because Goliath had brothers. David knew that the Lord was going to give him the right aim as well. <laughs> so you got to trust in who your God is. And quit standing fearfully. Quit retreating. Risk it. It's going to cost you something. But you will be victorious. Because God always has the strategy. And he threw the stone. He slung the stone. And God wants you to win the victory through faith. Just as David threw the stone and it hit him in the forehead and the giant went down and the little boy pulled the, 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 the giant's big sword out and he cut off his head with his own weapon, which is symbolic of Jesus. By death, he defeated death. 
That's not that God can take the enemy's weapon and allow you to use it to defeat the enemy. Those things that you have been through in your past, God can make them work together for the good so that you can use them as a weapon to watch the enemy go down. You know it. You know it. You know it. You know it. Do you mind if I say it? Do you mind if I say it? Former cutter. The enemy, the weapon that the enemy was destroying you with. God uses this girl right now to speak to people who are struggling with the same thing. And people have been set free through her testimony. All because she advanced. All because she was willing to advance with faith. Where are you, Davids? I didn't come all the way up here this weekend for you to look at me. I came up here this weekend because I want to inspire you that greater things are yet to come in this city. But we need people all over this church to pick up the stone and the sling and rush after giants and watch them fall in the name of Jesus. Where are you at, David? Who's ready to advance? Who's Listen, quit worrying about ISIS. Quit worrying about ISIS. They can't harm a hair on your head unless God gives them a permission to. We've got the gospel. That's the most powerful weapon on the planet. Quit worrying about the economy. God's able to supply all of our needs according to his riches and glory. We listen to those giants every single day and think we can't achieve victory. And we're fearful people that need the gospel and he rushed at the giant and see today some of you need to get into counseling because David took time to prepare his bag before he went after the giant some of you need to destroy some idols in your household some of you need to begin serving in your church the church is the conduit for ministry by the way that's biblical you can look it up later but we achieve this victory through our faith look what first John says what first john says let's read this together out loud everybody in this place on the count of three one two three four we're going to read that one more time and i want you to shout through our faith and i want you to give god a hand because from faith we are able to have faith that's how we came to jesus that's what it says in romans 1 17 for the righteousness of god is re revealed from heaven from faith for faith so when you get to through our faith i want you to say it loud one two three four every let's give god a hand we don't have to be defeated. Yeah, you'll have bad days. Yeah, it'll be hard. No, you won't get everything you want. No, God probably won't give you the vehicle that you really want. That's probably not how it's going to work. But you're going to experience incredible victory in your life. And victory is going to look a little bit different than the world describes it. But we defeat this evil world through our faith. Through our faith through our faith the gospel will advance through our faith the kingdom will advance through our faith eastland life church will bust at the seams with people through our faith people will reach full their full potential in god through our faith does anybody have faith in this place and are ready to activate it You focus on your giants, you stumble. But you focus on your God, your giants tumble. Rush at your giant with a God-saturated soul. Here's my favorite, here's my favorite part of this. Ian, I gotta show you my favorite part of this message. I'm gonna sit by you. Move that. So active faith is aware of who you are, right? Say I'm a new creation. then active faith is aware of who God is, right? Say he's the God of victory. Look at somebody in the eye and say he's the God of victory. You got to remember that. Then active faith advances. Say it's time to get moving. 
Remember, I said, quit waiting on a move of God. We are the move of God. The church is a move of God. Quit waiting on those moments. Moments will happen. Moments are happening this morning. But quit waiting on it. We are the move of God. Jesus has put us in charge of the ministry. He has given us his authority. But here's my favorite part of this. Go to that next slide. Active faith, you know what it does, Ian? It activates other people. Active faith activates other people. It means when you start applying your faith and you start having victory, it activates other people around you. That's why me as the pastor at my church, I'm the real worship leader. It's the law of the lid. If I'm not worshiping, why should anybody else worship, right? Nobody else should worship if the pastor's not. If he's, if he's more concerned about his notes than he is responding to what God's done for him, why should anybody else work, worship? But active faith activates other people. When people see victory, it inspires them to get active. When they see victory, it inspires them and it motivates them to keep going. And those people that have been idle, when they see victory, it makes them want to get up and rush at the enemy. Can I say it? Can I say it? We had a battle last night, but the victory belonged to the Lord. Callie gave her life to Jesus last night, everybody. And if you want to know the story, you can ask her about it and it'll make sense to you. Active faith activates others. You know why I come to tell you that next week we're baptizing three people. And then when you guys baptize, we celebrate because we're not in a competition because it's a win for the kingdom. It activates me to want to experience more victory. Active faith activates other people. Look at the scripture after David took down that filthy, uncircumcised Philistine. When your giant goes down, look what happens. Look at the scripture. Put it up there. Then the men of Israel and Judah gave a great shout of triumph and rushed after the Philistines. No longer were they putting on the armor and walking out and retreating. When that giant went down, it activated their faith that we can win this battle. And they went and destroyed the Philistines and they plundered their camp. When God does something incredible in your life, when you achieve victory through your faith, it'll activate other people. As a matter of fact, that's what we're called to do because we have been saved by Jesus and that is victory in our own life. We're called to go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them. Active faith activates others. Let me ask you something, believers. Are you making disciples? Are you looking at the giant of complaining, of your preferences, of fear, of your failure? The greatest example of this is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He activated us. Look what it says in Acts 1.8. Look what it says in Acts 1.8. But you will receive what? Power. That's the Greek word dunamis, which means dynamite. It means you're playing with dynamite inside of you if you are a believer. He activated them when the Holy Spirit became, came upon them. And they were his witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth. Because of those guys right here, we're meeting here today. Active faith activates others.